Well, thanks, Emerson. I thought that was a great presentation. That's one reason Emerson comes back every year. I was telling him that should be paraphrase his presentation, the, the gospel according to Emerson. <laughs> but it was, it was nice, a very nice recap of it, things. Well, I'm going to give you a recap also. In some respects, it's not quite as eloquently presented as what Emerson gave you, but it's a sort of an a assessment of our quorum performance trial. You don't hear much about our quorum performance trial. And I've entitled it, Lessons Learned from the, uh, from the Ohio Quorum Performance Test, 1972 to 2018. Before I get started, let me just mention some of my other members of the team. Rich Minyo, who manages the test, does a fantastic job. Alan Geyer, who's a, research, a senior research associate. Dave Lonis, uh, uh, Dave Lonis is uh, one of our IT specialists up at Worcester, the OARDC. And Alex Lindsay, you don't see an ecophysiologist often involved in the quorum performance trial, but he gets involved a lot. And they all, do a, they, don't, they all make significant contributions to this program. But obviously it got started back in 1972, way before I got uh, associated with it. And I think it was started by, Emerson, you, were, you started off at Ohio, you finished up at Ohio State. And I think it was Dollinger, who was the corn breeder back then, who got it started. Uh, EJ, it was EJ Dollinger or something, but... But I'm going to, I'll give you a brief overview of the trial, uh, some of the plot management data collection protocols. Uh, I'll refer to the quorum performance test sometimes probably as the OCPT. You'll see it described that way in some of the s slides. And then I'll finalize uh, the discussion with some future considerations. The Ohio quorum performance test, uh, the purpose of the test is to provide unbiased comparisons of hybrid seed corn available in Ohio. The results can aid farmers in selecting hybrids best suited to their farming operations and production environments. Uh, Emerson, uh, Joe Lauer promotes his corn performance trial. He calls it a commercial uh, a consumer reports for commercial corn hybrids. But the, the, but the Ohio corn performance test also offers insight into hybrid performance trends uh, and for the past 46 years here in Ohio. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm not going to focus on the bulletin or the website that you might look at in December and November or December when you're making a hybrid decision. A little background on the, where the trials are conducted. We have 10 locations in the test right now. We have three regions in the state. In the map you see here, we've got blue dots, which indicate in the, uh, the northwest region sites. We have green dots, which indicate sites in the northeast or central region. And then we have red uh, circles, red dots that are in the southwest, south central, west central region. And there's four in that region. The other regions have three, three test sites. Well, we collect, uh, obviously collect them grain yield, uh, harvest grain moisture, percent emergence, harvest plant population, and stock lodging. And we also collect other hybrid characteristics. I, I think a lot of my counterparts do this also. Uh, we collect, you know, when, when problems arise, uh, we collect information on the plots. We may not publish that in our bulletin, but we sh share that information in newsletter articles, and we also share it with the seed companies so they know what their hybrids are, what, what, their, what sort of issues their hybrids may have experienced. And those would include, include uh, data on ear rots, uh, moldy grains. Sometimes we've actually collected grain from the, the plots and, and rated percent moldy grain in our samples. We've done that with green snap, percent green snap in our plots so that the companies know which of their hybrids exhibited the greatest green snap. So we collect data like that and share it with the companies. Each hybrid entry is evaluated using three replications per site and a randomized complete block design and each hybrid is evaluated at three or four of the sites within a region. We use the fertilizers and pesticides are applied according to recommended cultural practices for obtaining optimal yields. I think in our southwest, south central region this year, most of the sites were actually apply, uh, we, uh, received fungicides and foliar fungicides, and I think that was beneficial given some of the disease issues we encounter. And then what's particularly unique, distinct about the Ohio corn performance trial is that we allow seed companies to specify a final plant population and a percent overplant for each of the hybrids they, they enter. So that means if they've got a particular hybrid that, that does better at 36,000 or, or conversely at 30,000 or 29,000, we let them select the population. And other, other states uh, typically don't do that. 
Now, Rich Menyo, when he's planning the, the trials in his cab, he's already des decided what's, what plots are going to be what. And then one of his monitors will have, a, will have this appear on it. And each, each one of those different colors represents a population or a seating rate to achieve a, a target population. We plant, I, we think we use pretty good equipment in our trials, pretty state of the art, at least from what I've experienced in, with other trials in the past, in past years. But we, have, we plant uh, the hybrids with um, an Almeco Seed Pro 360 plot planner with the SkyTrip GPS. Each plot consists of four 30 inch rows, approximately 25 feet long. I know small plots are not politically correct, it seems, these days. We've got to have plots that are a couple, maybe a mile long and, and, and 40 feet wide. But I think a lot of good information comes, still comes out of small plot data. We've, all of our plots receive forced 3G insecticide. Our major uh, interest is determining the genetic yield potential of the hybrids. We're not interested in determining whether they have resistance to uh, BT or they have herbicide resistance. We want to know how well these hybrids perform. We still evaluate a number of non, or we have evaluated a number of uh, non-GMO hybrids. And so we don't have resistance to, these, to those insects uh, in our, those hybrids. So we're trying to level the playing field so we can get a good assessment of yield potential in those hybrids, the non-GMO hybrids. You know, we harvest the plots with a, an Almeco uh, SPC40 plot combine. It's been very reliable. So what we're going to focus on most of the, in my brief conversation, because I'm not going to discuss this subject in depth, but just to give you a taste of what, what we've seen and uh, give you some perspective, is to characterize changes in yield and other economically important hybrid performance parameters that have occurred in the OCPT since 1972. So you're going to see a couple of graphs that look like this. Um, this particular one shows the Ohio corn performance test yields uh, versus the state averages. I'm going to use the state average state yields that comes from the National Ag Statistics Service, NASS, for comparison. The red, the red circles indicate the uh, results from the yearly results from the Ohio corn performance test going back to 1972, and the blue squares indicate the average yields for the state. And I've included the uh, trend line equations there, uh, we've done, uh, uh, which are based on some simple regressions of yield and, and, and other, uh, on these other parameters uh, with, with production years. And you can see here that the, uh, the, over time, we've seen a steady increase in yield. Um, the R-square values, the higher those values are, the closer they are to one, indicates there's a little more reliability uh, with, with, as far as these, the, the strength of the relationships. And you can see that our corn performance trial yields have typically been mm -hmm. higher. They're typically about anywhere from, uh, they average about 45 bushels different from the state averages, but anywhere from 20 to 80 bushels greater than the state averages. And why is that? Well, when we pick out the corn performance test sites, we want to pick out sites that are as uniform as possible, have high fertility, have very favorable growing conditions, and we've been successful in, in doing that. So we have the relatively small blocks, you know, four to six acres, and we, can, we have chosen, I think, which, uh, sites that are going to be most likely to give us uh, consistent high yields. So we've been seeing in the, uh, over time, uh, if we look at this over, uh, we see that the average corn performance yields have increased at the rate of two bushels per acre per year, going back to 1972. That's the corn performance test. The state yields have increased at, at 1.9 bushels per acre per year. The average corn performance and state yields uh, were 145 and 92 bushels per acre in 1972, uh, respectively, compared to 251 and 187 bushels per acre in 2018. And basically, I kind of look at our corn performance test sites as almost like high yield sites. We're not using we're not using fungicides on all the sites. We're not using narrow rows, but we are using high plant populations, much higher plant populations than average, and we have highly fertile soils. And we're in a corn soybean rotation, so they have potential for high yields, and they've demonstrated that over time. They're, as I said before, they're running about 45 bushels more than our state average. You know, with the advent or the introduction of the BT hybrids in the late 90s, it's been popular uh, sometimes for agronomists to use that 1996 uh, point in time as kind of, the, of, a, of a watershed moment. And at that point, some agronomists have suggested that we've seen an in a greater increase in yields or y the yield trend changed uh, fundamentally for a lot of our corn acreage across the country and that we would see a higher, a greater yield increase. And that may be true further west. 
and it, and it certainly seems to be evidence to some extent here at Ohio, but this I just decided just for, just for the sake of it, just kind of look and sh show you what the trend line looks for like since 1996 for the Ohio Corn Performance Test and also for the state average. You can see that with the, our trend line equation there indicates that we're looking at about a 3.9 bushel per acre uh, per year increase since for just those 22 years and that, you know, looking at a short period of time, a short interval, there's potential problems with that because it's not as reliable as looking at a long interval. And then if we look at the state average again, it's about, or the state trend line, it suggests about a 2.3 bushel per acre uh, per year increase. So there's you know, some evidence that we have seen some differences. I would almost argue though, and I'm off script here, but given what uh, Emerson was saying, is I'm not so much sure, I'm not so sure that it, this, was, this increase is due to the transgenic traits as I am convinced that it's, I'm fairly convinced that it's due to stock quality. I really think stock quality has, was, uh, was improving tremendously about the same time. And here in the Eastern Corn Belt, it's, it's helped us tremendously. Well, I've taken that, I've, I've looked at some of the trend lines at other locations too because, you know, we don't see that, those trend lines um, necessarily at all the other locations. If you go to some of our, two of our sites, South Charleston and Hoytville, and, and by the way, these are sites that have been in the test for the last, you know, last 46 years. We're, do, we're conducting corn trials at locations on fields that where we did these same trials in 1972. So we got yields that were 140 bushels in, 19, in, in about 140 bushels in 1972 and today we're getting yields in some of these plots that are close to 300 bushels. So they're kind of living laboratories for us. And, but if you look at the South Charleston and the Hoytville trend lines, you see something different. In South Charleston, you see that our trends, we've been looking at about a 3.8 bushel per acre per year increase. That's a very different environment at Hoytville. There it's been about a 1.9 bushel per acre per yield increase. Hoytville's in Northwest Ohio and it's performed on, it's a good, it, on any given year, the yields at Hoytville can be the same as at, at South Charleston or maybe better, but we chronically run into problems with either too much rain, too much water, it seems, or too, or too dry at that location. South Charleston, we perform these trials. We always make sure we're on a, on a Kokomo Silty clay loam. That's almost, I, wanna, I don't want to tempt Providence and say it's a bulletproof drought soil, but it's a very productive soil. I think you could bag that soil and sell it in Columbus. It's so good. It's excellent. And it's given, so I think it's responsible for one of some of the environments, uh, uh, or some of the uh, favorable environmental conditions we've experienced. But these types of differences exist, and if you, it's, I was kind of curious to see what the county differences were over the same period of time, or they looked at Clark County, where South Charleston located is, is located, and it was about, I'm gonna round the numbers a little bit, about 2.7 bushels per acre per year since 1996, and I should have got backed up and said it, we started in 1996 in that last one. Wood County, about 1.67. So the corn performance trials at, at, at South Charleston and at Hoytville sort of, sort of mirror what you're seeing in those counties in the, and some of the challenges that Wood County faces compared to South Charleston. So Wood County is not deriving the benefit, I think, in some of these increases and in, in, in some of these improvements and hybrids that South Charleston is, has experienced. Well, let's look at final stands because you know, I mentioned a minute ago that this is where what makes our program different from others. I should mention that if a company does not select uh, a, a population, we, they default to 34,000. So we, we provide that target population for them. So again, the red circles indicate the corn performance trial. The blue squares indicate the state. And over time, you've, you, can, you can see that there's a pretty steady increase for both of those, para, almost parallel. And you see increasing, the increasing corn, perform, corn performance test and state plant populations are, were, are closely associated with the greater yields we've seen. The average corn performance populations have increased at almost 290 plants per acre compared to 261 plants per acre for the state average. In 1972, the average corn performance test and state plant populations were about 24,000 and about 18,000 plants respectively. In 2018, the plant population for the corn performance test and the state averaged 33, about 33,400 and 30,400 plants respectively for, uh, uh, for, that, uh, for that year, for this year. Average emergence, I have, don't have any more data to compare against the state, so now we're gonna look exclusively at uh, the corn performance test data. 
Average emergence, well, we've seen a steady increase um, in, in emergence in our core performance test with seed entries that are put in this. And you'd always, you would think that the companies would give you seed that has, would have very good emergence, percent emergence. It's increased at a, at a rate of about 0.2% per year. The average emergence of corn hybrids in the test has increased from 86% in 72 to 96% in 2018. And I think the increase in emergence can be related to improved seed quality of hybrid entries and the use of more seed applied fungicides and insecticides. Stock lodging, you know, this is one, Emerson, I, I, I'm always amazed at how much of, how improved our stock quality was. When I started at Ohio State in the early 90s doing experiments, if I planted much over 30,000, I did get some stock lodging. It was guaranteed. I get, it wouldn't be terrific, but I'd probably have 10, 15 percent of my plants would, be, would, would lodge. Now it's pretty much, it's non-existent. I mean, we basically don't, just don't see lodging in our plots in these very favorable, good growing conditions. But our average, if you see kind of a scatter of points here, here we don't see as tight a relationship, but we do see a trend, a, de a decline in stock lodging. The very time we're seeing our plant populations increase in the corn performance, in the corn performance trial, we've actually seen our stock lodging decrease. And I suspect that if this data, it wasn't just, if we cleaned up this data a little bit, maybe you've thrown out this one outlier there that I have a question mark by and maybe some other sites, other, other data, we'd see a tighter relationship. Anybody tell me what happened in the year 2008 to cause uh, a lodging that was, what, about 25%? Any, any thoughts? Wind. Wind, yeah, but what, any particular event, a name? This is what my plots look like that year. Anything I planted, I think after May 25th or above 30,000 looked like this at harvest. Yeah, but I heard the right name there. 2008, that was Hurricane Ike. So just like 2012 uh, showed, the, showed that our, our corn yield increases are still subject to, are so, still vulnerable to serious droughts, our crop at the end of the growing season is vulnerable to high wind problems. I think that year, I think we had a couple million people in Ohio that were without electricity for, for a day. And may, I know in Columbus there were several hundred thousand people affected with, uh, with uh, electrical outages for a number of, of days. So average lodging has been highly variable during the past 46 years. It's ranged from 0 to 25 percent. Usually averages less than 10 percent. You know, in, in 2018 we thought we'd have some lodging problems in our plots and we did, in our locations, and we did, but it was usually a handful of hybrids, maybe, maybe four or five hybrids at most at, a, at any given location that lodge badly. And by that I mean maybe 10, 20, 30 percent. Most of the hybrids stood very well. Generally we were looking at, you know, less than two or three percent. And this was in some environments where lodging, we had heavy winds, strong winds, uh, some, some fairly, uh, they weren't stressful conditions in the end of growing season, but they were conditions that were uh, given the disease pressure we had that should have been a prescription for some lodging problems. And I think this, uh, what we, we can attribute better lodging to is improvements in stock quality and disease and insect resistance. Now, I'm, I'm certain the BT traits have helped us, the corn borer traits have helped us, but I think this lignification, Emerson, that you referred to is very important for our corn hybrids today. And I think that's one reason, you know, the BT hybrids, I'm going off script here again, but you know, the BT hybrids sometimes get the, a bad rap. They say, people say they don't break down much in the soil. Well, I think it has let more, I don't think it's so much the BT hybrids. I think it's lignification that's causing some of these problems with residue breakdown. So we've seen limited, so these, these traits have improved and, uh, and that we've seen limited lodging as average plant populations have increased. Average grain moisture, and again, Emerson, this kind of supports what you were saying about the fact we have maybe more a trend towards earlier maturing hybrids. But over time, we've seen, again, this is kind of a scatter of points. You know, R square is not close to one there. It's 0.34. It's not as strong. But certainly, we see a decline in, in, soil, in grain moisture over time. So you decreased at, uh, so the grain moisture is decreased at 0.11% uh, per year. And, you know, there's a number of factors that can influence uh, grain moisture, planting and harvest dates, various stress conditions. Earlier maturing hybrid entries and improvements in grain dry down, though, have contributed to a decrease in average percent moisture. Average test weight, well, basically this is the same story as percent moisture. 
you know, as we know, there's an inverse relationship between grain moisture at harvest versus test weights. And, uh, and you know, our early hybrids are typically having higher test weights than our later maturing hybrids. And basically, we do see, it doesn't look like a strong relationship here, but we do see a slight increase in test weight. And they ha it has increased at the rate of 0 .0, 0 0.1 pound per bushel per year. And it's related to the same factors affecting grain moisture. Well, I switch, I've stopped with the, the trend line analysis or trend line evaluations. And I'm going to switch over just to give you a brief story of the transgenics and non-transgenics in the corn test going back to 1996 when they were first introduced in the test. About 2005, we switched from being a non-transgenic test to a, not, a transgenic test. And today in 2018, uh, we had 183 transgenic hybrids in the test and only nine non-transgenics. But as a result of that, we still treat the test as, when it comes to herbicides, we treat it as a non-transgenic test. So 90% of our entries are, non -trans are transgenic. An issue with the corn performance test that, uh, you know, is that the percent of corn hybrids that, uh, in, for, in the corn test for multiple years has decreased. And this gets back to the issues with, with the transgenics. Not an issue so much, but when they started getting introduced in the programs back in 2005 and 2006, we started seeing a lot of turnover. We, there were times when we were approaching 50% uh, of our hybrids being in the test for two years, but that's changed. We had some time. We had years where we had less than 5% of the entries in the test for three years and less than 20% for two years. Now we're, we're back to 36% of the entries in the test for two years and 16% for three years. And this has some implications when it comes to selecting hybrids. Because you like growers, and we always, we we're always telling growers as extension specialists, you know, use as many locations as many years as possible when you make your decision. And that's increasingly difficult. Some thought, some, some a brief uh, overview of the traits in our trials, and I guess I think some of this information is, is similar to what's going on across the Corn Belt as far as other big uh, other corn <coughs> testing programs. So this gives you some perspective in that regard. This just shows you what we're looking at right now in 2018 in the way of, of hybrid traits. We're basically a stack trait test. 60% of our entries have three or more traits in them. No traits, we do have, you know, we have the no traits with the non-GMOs. We have some that have no one trait, maybe a hybrid, maybe herbicide, resi herbicide resistance. Some have two traits, herbicide resistance and corn borer, and then three traits might be two, two, herbicide, uh, two herbicide traits and one uh, insect trait, above ground insect trait, and so on. We even have some with five traits, which might include the Monsanto uh, uh, drought guard trait, which is transgenic. And almost 60% of the hybrids we test are, are refuge in a bag. Uh, and this just shows you the range of the technology products we look at. You know, everything from none, uh, no traits. But as you get down here, we have some hybrids that have uh, five traits and maybe or eight events or seven events. So in 2018, we were looking at 15 tra trait sets and 23 technology products. So trends, just to kind of a recap what I've, I've talked about. Average yields have increased 70% and are closely associated with changes in plant population, which are 40% greater than those used in the 1970s. Increased plant populations have not resulted in greater lodging, which can be attributed to improvements in stock quality and insect and disease resistance. Average harvest grain moisture has decreased and test weight increased, which is related to improved grain dry down and earlier maturing corn hybrids or entries. And hybrid turnovers increased with less than 50% of the entries evaluated more than one year. I'll make some, under some side notes then concerning the corn performance test. Uh, it also serves as a valuable research platform. The hybrid, we've used it, the corn performance test as a way to evaluate uh, hybrid interactions involving maturity, plant populations, uh, planting dates, and harvest dates. And we've used it to evaluate the drought tolerant hybrids that came on the market maybe about five to t seven years ago. It's helped, it initiated some research we've, we're still doing now on planting depth effects on corn performance. We recently finished up a study in 2018 looking at ultra early corns. And I'll mention a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, the ultra early corn research was initiated uh, with the help of a, of a conservation tillage technology mini grant. And there was interest uh, to do this work because uh, growers in the northern part of the state, the northeast part of the state in particular, 
were wondering, and some were actually implementing or using ultra-early hybrids uh, in their cover crop systems. They were interested to see if they could use these ultra-early hybrids, take them off, harvest them early, and, and establish a cover crop more effectively than, that, than using the procedures they were currently using. We used the corn performance test to evaluate hybrid responses to ear rots and leaf diseases. We're doing that with the plant pathologists, uh, like Pierce Paul. We're talking about using the test this year to monitor tar spot, which is a disease that the plant pathologists seem to be quite concerned about, and, and as well as our, our old standbys, gray leaf spot and northern corn leaf blight. We also used the corn performance test to uh, come up with uh, or help uh, Steve Coleman. Steve Coleman came to us and asked if we would use the, the corn performance test for putting out his potassium and his phosphorus trials to, uh, to generate data for the new tri-state evaluations, the tri-state fertility evaluations. So the data from the corn performance trial locations were used to, to put that, uh, to provide Steve with some of the baseline information he used to make his recommendations. I mentioned that ultra early corn test, and this is the sort of uh, you know one reason we did this was we were wondering if there was enough interest in this type of a cat, uh, the ultra early hybrids that maybe would warrant a new category in our corn performance test, uh, maybe on a uh, really early hybrid maturity category. We do actually have a lot of early hybrids grown in northeastern Ohio. If you go up to Mahoney County, and Mahoney County, 90 to 95 day hybrids are kind of conventional hybrids. They 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 don't use the hybrids down in the rest of the state. But in a, we, what we were interested in were 90-day hybrids, come, and we compared those with our, what we call commonly grown maturities. In this test, we, were, we broke down the 90-day hybrids into two categories. We looked at the 90 to 95 days and 96 to 100-day hybrids. And we were typically looking at about 20 hybrids in each one of those categories, and we compared them with five or six hybrids in the 104 to 109-day commonly grown maturity category. And these were high-yielding hybrids, these 104 to 109-day hybrids. They weren't dogs that we selected just to be uh, very show competition. These were good yielding hybrids. And what we found, as you might expect, is that the 104, the 109 day hybrids, the commonly grown maturities, out yielded the ultra early hybrids by, by about 10% in 2017. It was 11% this past year. It's been that, in that range for all three years of this trial. This is the third year for the test. Uh, but what we did find was that when we compared the, looked at sort of the economic returns with the 96 day hybrids, the 96 to 100 day hybrids with the 104 to 109 day hybrids, when we harvested them at this moisture level at about 20, on the average almost 29%, we were finding that the cost of drying down and the yield penalties we were seeing for test weight, low test weights, actually made the difference between the 96, and, uh, 96 to 100 day hybrids and those of the, in the 104 day hybrid, 104 to 109 day hybrids, there simply wasn't much of a difference. So econo well, economically, there wasn't any difference as far as uh, returns. So I think that holds some promise for some growers who are growers in some parts of the state who have uh, cover crop uh, plans in the future. From, the edu from an education or extension uh, perspective, the corn performance trials also helped us answer questions that growers have asked us uh, regarding uh, new, these new technologies we've seen more and more of in recent years. And this particular table shows the grain yields of hybrids grouped by insect resistance and herbicide tolerance traits in the 2018 trials. Now, a couple of years ago, it's not as much of an issue today, but a couple of years ago, growers were asking us whether you know, these hybrids, the hybrids that were coming out, the stack trait hybrids, which we were seeing more and more of, were they higher yielding than our hybrids that have fewer traits? In other words, would, did you need more traits to get higher yields? Because there was this perception that the, the highest yields were associated with these uh, multi-trait hybrids, above and below ground traits. And in this particular table, just to demonstrate what we were, how we were responding to those questions, we were showing that, for example, in our test we had these were some trait sets that were among the most popular that companies were entering hybrids in. I highlighted three of those traits, but and they were in these three trait uh, three categories. We had uh, two traits, uh, three traits, and we had one with four, four traits and varying numbers of events. And we looked at uh, the yields in the three regions of the state: the southwest, south central, central region, the northwest, and the north central northeast region. And if you look at those two yellow bars there, the yellow rows, you'll see that if you look at yields, you'll see that there's really no difference in the yields between those tr uh, three uh, sets of hybrids, the three trait sets. One only has th uh, two sets of tra uh, two traits. There's the two corn borer event traits, uh, and then two, two events for the corn borer, one for the glyphosate. Then you drop down to one that has four uh, traits. We've got corn borer, rootworm, 
life of state liberty, and there's a total of eight events there. And then when we have one that has uh, three traits and four events, and you can see the yields are no different. But this is the type of information we can use from the core performance test to answer some of these questions growers have. And just for more, just to clarify what those were, those were VT, the one at the top there was VT Pro, VT Pro Rib, Smart Stack, Smart Stack Rib, and then Optimum Acre Max and Optimum, Optimum Intersect. Well, we're like uh, states across the Corn Belt. Uh, in recent years, we've seen the number of companies involved in our trials decrease. We reached our high watermark uh, before I came in 1986. We had 71 companies, and today we're down to 24 companies. I don't think we're going to go back to 71 companies. I don't think that's in the, a likelihood. I'm not going to be around when that happens, let me put it that way. So we've seen this, and I think that's, it's really not that much of an issue for us because we're heavily involved in doing other types of evaluations. I'd like us to stay very much involved in hybrid testing. You know, you go out to some of the states in Nebraska, for example, they've got 9.5 million acres or more, and they have no core performance trial anymore out there. They simply, the companies have stopped participating. Fortunately, in the Eastern Corn Belt, we have states around us, Indiana, uh, or Wisconsin especially, a lot of the states around us, we still have very strong performance testing programs. And I hope, I think for growers, it's still very beneficial. But we're going to see our, pro our program change in the future. We're going to be a platform of for evaluation of new products. Uh, just to give you some examples, we do regular tr uh, testing of new seed technologies, uh, including biological seed treatments. That's just one of, of several. We do supplemental hybrid testing. We look at experimental hybrids for companies, hybrids that are close to release. Companies uh, are quite a are interested in us doing some evaluations for them in this regard. We have uh, uh, companies asking us to do evaluations of organic and non-GMO hybrids. Uh, we're involved in collaboration with several multiple disciplinary projects. Uh, the genetic, uh, the G by E, their gen genotype by environment study. This is a big study that uh, f that's the. Uh, National Corn Growers and Iowa State University is running and across the country and we're involved in that one. We even have a trial with Michigan State where we're looking at silage testing up at the Northwest Branch. So we have a lot of irons in the fire in different areas. So our, our, not all our eggs are in one basket with hybrid testing. Well, I'll stop there. Uh, the results of our corn performance test, as I think most of you know, are available online. And the information I used to put this, taste, uh, this presentation together, some of that archival data, that's also available online. If you want to go back and look at the, how the performance test, what sort of yields the performance test was generating many years ago, it's, it's available online. Thank you.